this program uh, today and every day here at our Naval War College. Ambassador McClendon, Admiral Saunas, Admiral Chatfield, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we meet again in, in our quest for knowledge. It is my privilege to welcome you to this landmark gathering, our second Newport Art Scholars Initiative, hosted by the U.S. Naval War College. And this initiative reflects this institution's commitment and the commitment of the U.S. Navy. A pretty strong and enduring partnership with your nations and navies individually and collectively as one art. I want to first express my deep gratitude to the entire Naval War College team and everyone who had a hand in making this seminar come to life. You know, pull, pulling off an event like this is truly a team effort and I'm grateful to be part of it. I want to thank the sailors and scholars who are here for this initiative, all of you, and your heads of the Navy for your leadership, your dedication to learning, and most of all, your friendship. All our nations and navies, with the exception of Russia, are here today. A subtle reminder that our actions on the world stage can influence relations among nations and navies within the art. I'm hopeful, however, that in time, we can turn the page and focus not solely on the things that divide us, but the challenges, the opportunities, and the responsibilities that unite us along our northern shores. A place where both great power competition and great power cooperation converge in the fate of humanity lies, the Arctic Ocean region. The task of learning about the Arctic lies with leaders of every nation and navy, large and small. For great powers have no monopoly on knowledge. Great power competition is not the only source of tension in the Arctic, and the icebreaker race is not the only arms race in the Arctic. Even subtle miscalculations and accidents between military forces are dangerous in an increasingly ice-free Arctic. <coughs> the quest for knowledge, like the quest for peace, is the responsibility of every nation and navy, and we must remain committed and aligned. <coughs> for the value of this initiative work is not dependent on the existence of conflict. Nor can we, nor can learning come from just a three-day seminar. Rather, learning is learning from one another is a daily, a weekly, a monthly process. A process we will pursue, gradually changing opinions, slowly eroding assumptions, quietly building new knowledge. And however undramatic the pursuit of knowledge, that pursuit must go on and all Arctic nations and navies should, should take part. The fact remains that as an Arctic nation, the end has a great power. The United States, and more specifically, American Sea Services, the Navy and Marine Corps and Coast Guard team, have a special responsibility in the Arctic. And that responsibility is threefold. It's a responsibility to our own citizens, to the responsibility to the people of the Arctic and those outside of the Arctic who are impacted by our decisions, and the responsibility to the next generation. I believe Russia also has these same sacred responsibilities. And those responsibilities require our two nations and navies to focus less on our differences and more on ways and means that we can resolve them peacefully. Yet despite our many disagreements, we have in recent years agreed on oil spill response, on search and rescue, on managing shipping routes, and on sharing scientific data in the Iron North. I believe that Russia, the United States, and our northern neighbors, all of you, can achieve further agreements in the Arctic, which spring from our shared interests to prevent conflict. And believe it or not, this year, 2020, marks the 24th anniversary of the Ottawa Declaration, which established the Arctic Council. Recently, however, I questioning and asking myself whether or not we can actually sign that declaration today particularly when we listen to the words and watch the actions of some. But that same foresight, that same courage that brought our leaders together nearly a quarter century ago is necessary, once again, to forge a stable, constructive, and results-oriented security relationship in the Arctic. And ultimately, security is a political choice, a choice that leaders have to make. And who is committed to supporting every country's interests in the Arctic, while upholding a strong rule-based order. An Arctic 
working with security is, is not a cost, but an investment. An Arctic region in which security propels sustainable development. An Arctic in which all of us benefit from the freedom and security we need and deserve. Our vision of Arctic security is not for some. It's not security for most. It's security for all. Great powers and emerging ones. Arctic and Arctic, our, our, our states. Citizens and indigenous peoples. Everyone, everywhere. Because security is an end in itself. Because it's a fundamental right and it's a means to peace and prosperity. It's one of the reasons why we created the uh, Import Arctic Scholars Initiative. And this collaborative research program is the first of its kind that brings together sailors and scholars from Arctic nations to study and report on important questions asked by our heads and Navy and the many people who care deeply about the future of the Arctic. It brings together real world operators, practitioners, those at the tip of the sphere, with leading academics, some of the brightest minds in the world, many of you. And we have an impressive class this year, many disciplines and different services, from submarine commanders and ship drivers to scholars and speechwriters. But the real strength of our work is that despite our differences, we're still able to come together around shared goals to educate and inform leaders to improve regional readiness and foster lasting security relationships and partnerships in the Arctic. And as, as Admiral Shackville mentioned earlier, Admiral Stephen Lewis founded the Naval War College over a century ago as a place of original research on all questions related to war, the statesmanship connected to war, and a paraphrase. And equally important and ever so relevant today, the prevention of war. And that's our focus for NASI. And our work last year reinforced the infamous quote in the 2007 U.S. Maritime Strategy that preventing wars is just as important as winning them. And as Dean Mangold mentioned, in April 2018, during our opening seminar in Newport, we debated and decided early on in our studies and our collaboration that crisis and conflict runs contrary to the interests of all our nations and therefore should be avoided at all costs. And it is in that same spirit that we will conduct collaborative research on critical questions related to conflict prevention and security cooperation in the Arctic. So we came together 18 months ago and concluded our work with over 30 principles of Arctic security in the areas of awareness, confidence building measures, and capabilities. Principles that represent a new set of guidelines, new norms, to ensure that the Arctic remains an ocean of peace rather than a nuclear war. And these principles, for the most part, reflect consensus among our experts. They're meant to be aspirational and forward-thinking. They are meant to be inclusive and enduring. For the voices of all Arctic nations are represented. And they provide a means and a basis for decision making and action, an action that transcends governments or administrations or time. But let me be clear these principles, like the findings and recommendations that will develop this year, they do not represent official policies, nor do they represent the official positions or views of any one government, maybe your nation. Rather, they provide a starting point for discussion and engagement. We started our journey exploring strategies of our nations and navies and identifying common security challenges. We met again at our Midway Seminar in Newport and we debated and drafted principles. We traveled to Germany and partnered with the George C. Marshall Center where we engaged with other leading Arctic experts from Europe and Russia. And in April 2019, we concluded our work in Bergen, Norway, where we presented our principles of security to the heads of navies and coast guards and their representatives from the Arctic. Principles dealing with awareness serve two purposes, to help decision makers understand the physical, strategic, and geopolitical changes in the region, and to inform leaders of the shared interests and challenges facing our nations and navies. Our work on confidence building measures, or CDMs, focused on the types of activities navies and nations can take to reduce tension 
misperceptions or miscalculations, and ultimately, the likelihood of conflict. And our work on capabilities offer new pragmatic ways Arctic states can develop and deploy capabilities while keeping tensions low. And as much as I'd like to dive into all three principles, I'll highlight just a few to help frame our efforts this week. First, we found that security challenges that we'll face in the Arctic are multifaceted and very much interconnected. Arctic security combines traditional concepts of state defense and sovereignty, public safety, economic prosperity, and the well-being of communities and indigenous peoples, as well as preservation of the environment. We also found that military activity in the Arctic is growing in response to growing strategic security interests and economic interests in the region. In the years to come, maritime security forces of Arctic states and non-Arctic states will play a more prominent role in securing their own nation's interests. Finally, we concluded that a certain polar government structure in the Arctic is it's fairly well established. However, as was alluded to earlier, it doesn't necessarily include things and facilitate cooperation and dialogue on all hard security and defense issues in the Arctic. This recognition runs parallel to belief that tensions between major powers and instability in other regions could very well likely spill over in the Arctic. Our work on confidence building, building measures crafts an integrated framework of rules and norms that other states can adopt. Our holding mechanism whereby accidental conflict and unintended escalation can be prevented. And you'll hear a lot more about the CDMs later today. But I'll leave you with one final thought on regional regimes. And our work concluded that while existing mechanisms provide a good starting point for our security cooperation, we suggest potentially the development of something new or to strengthen the ones that are in place today. So building off this principle and the feedback from national capitals and heads of Navy, this is where we start our work in 2020. The world is waking up to a changing Arctic, whether we like it or not. And all of us, especially the Arctic nations and agents who call the Arctic home, have a responsibility to make sense of this change, the miscalculations, the friction points, and the catalyst and instability that could arise from these changes. So the question, therefore, is what frameworks are optimal to maintain open lines of communication, prevent and manage conflict, and increase security cooperation among navies and nations in the Arctic. That is our intellectual challenge. And in doing so, we must ask ourselves, why is security cooperation important to our national interests, to regional interests, to global interests? We must ask ourselves, how can our security cooperation be conceptualized and understood? And there are at least four cooperative security frameworks that are relevant to our work today, and that's alliances, collective security, regimes, and security communities. And while our security cooperation can take on many forms and be pursued for many reasons, our focus is on security dialogue and conflict management, new forms of military cooperation. Whether we're talking about existing frameworks, strengthening those, or creating efforts for new ones, our findings and recommendations. And the policies of today and tomorrow must be rooted in risks and benefits, advantages and disadvantages. We must understand the official and unofficial reasons for intervention. And whether the activities pursued by the frameworks of today actually address the security issues we face tomorrow. And we cannot create new knowledge on cooperative security frameworks without indigenous peoples, without those on the front lines of great power competition in the Arctic who hold deep-seated knowledge on how to adapt. And we should include them into our deliberations. And as many of the things that I've learned by listening to indigenous peoples during my travels across the Arctic is that they are close to the sea, they benefit from the sea, they also have an obligation to secure the sea, and they see the sea as themselves. That's the moment when you realize that if you organize your maritime forces, 
without traditional knowledge. If you train your maritime forces without traditional knowledge, and if you equip your maritime forces without indigenous knowledge, your actions can actually do more harm than good. So it's clear to me, and I think many of us in this room, that the Arctic Council, our Coast Guard form, play critical roles in keeping the Arctic safe and, and clean. But when it comes to security and defense, when it comes to understanding the role and influence of sea power in this new ocean, there has been a gaping hole of study, cooperation, and engagement until now. And through the Newport Arctic Scholars Initiative, we, our nations and navies have developed new knowledge and new friendships, new norms. That has made all of us stronger, smarter, and safer. And so I want to thank my fellow sailors and scholars for your commitment to this academic partnership on the Arctic. And given the extraordinary progress we've achieved already in this initiative, I'm confident that we'll continue our momentum in this seminar and beyond. So let's, let's share. Let's think big and let's write. And if we do all this and do it right, I'm confident that we will have a lasting impact on our nations and navies for years to come. Because when we help other nations and navies is when we can truly help ourselves. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, colleague, and dear friend, Carl Sons, to share his knowledge with us. Thank you.